Members of five great Indian tribes take part in the 65th anniversary of the Medicine Lodge Peace Treaty. Reenacting of sacred and ceremonial Indian dances were part of the historic pageant. The covered wagon parade depicting the advance of the pioneers was climaxed by a stirring Indian attack on the Pale Faces. A reminder of those grand old days when the West was really wild. we turn the pages of history to the days when Indians rule supreme. Soon, Navajo, Hopi, and Winnebago tribesmen join in the red man's ritual, the war dance. Navajo land, Arizona's vast tract of swordgrass, cactus and sagebrush. The last refuge of the first American Indians and until the beginning of the 19th century, the stronghold of the Navajos, aristocrats of the Indian tribes. Rating themselves far above the peaceful communities who were content to breed cattle and weave their famous blankets, the Navajos took what they wanted and prospered for a time, but that was more than a century ago. Today, the Navajos are mere tenants of the land they once owned. They roam the same plains, but their wanderings are limited by the state. In some respects, they haven't changed. They still live in little huts called hogans, eight-sided thatch roof dwellings with a bizarre scheme of decoration inside that's so typical of the race. On primitive looms, they still weave the ancient tribal symbols into fabrics which they trade with the white man for sugar, coffee, and beans. Their social standing is shown by the number of ornaments they wear, especially the turquoise rings which the Spaniards taught them to make centuries ago. There are several technical schools and the women and girls learn crafts that they can follow profitably when they finish their training, even after they're married. And they have a natural aptitude for embroidery. The men too are taught practical trades that make them useful members of the community. The elementary schools are plain brick buildings to which the children, with their parents, travel long distances. But the problem of the Indian's education isn't so plain. The Navajo has no written language, so the three R's come into their own again. Reading opens up wonderful new worlds for the children, and writing too. But these funny things they call letters want some drawing. While the parents wait, they do odd jobs for themselves. Father can have a little bit off the top, to sharpen his axe or mend his boots, probably his only pair. Modern hospitals bring the benefits of skilled nursing and antiseptics to the babies. Oh, yes, so tired. Yesterday, they had been born with nothing but the doubtful blessing of the medicine man, and Navajo girls are trained as maternity nurses. But the great problem of Navajo land is Navajo land itself. For years, overgrazing has left much of the reservation barren and useless. The livestock must be cut down until the pasturage is plentiful again. As it is, there's hardly enough grass for some of the flocks to keep wool and mutton together. Horses, too, must be reduced if the range is to come back. It'll be hard for the Navajo to part with his horses. Though they're underfed and scrawny, they are still a worthless sign of his wealth. Today, under state supervision, the Navajos are learning to reclaim the land and labourers are going to it, 
constructing reservoirs in an irrigation scheme that will make again the country suitable for farming. Experimental areas have been marked out for land development schemes and great progress has been made in bringing back the soil to its old fertility. What was once bare and arid is now lush grazing land and the Navajo sheep are fattening. The last refuge is now the first and only refuge for a new generation of enlightened Indians who will honor their heritage. Navajo land has been reborn. 9,000 miles from the great prairies of southern Alberta, a redskin chief dwells in the land of the Pale Faces. Less than 12 moons ago, Chief White Eagle welcomed a princess to Kicking Horse Pass. Now his teepee stands in a field at Windsor, not far from the castle of that same princess, now his queen. Strange hunting grounds these for a chief of the Stony tribe, offshoot of the great Assiniboines. He's in England for a few months only to entertain audiences in Billy Smart Circus. But it's his chance also to show the pale faces how the men of his tribe live and work together. Now he brings his weight to bear while Buffalo Head, medicine man to his tribe, makes the roof of his teepee safe for the night. Once they used old arrow shafts to fasten the flaps, once too they sheltered under nothing but untanned hides. But times have changed, now their roof is of canvas. <laughs> For Blueberries, daughter of Buffalo Head, time promises even greater changes. For now, domestic virtues rank level with the arts of the warrior. But Rabbit Tail, son of a warrior, is not so sure. Twenty-five poles, all interlocking at the top, combine to give strength to the teepee. Light and easy to erect, it is the typical dwelling place of a wandering people. Fleetness of foot, the movements of wild game, that and a strong arm for the bow spell contentment in their far-off hunting grounds. Snow will cover the hunting grounds by the time Blue Mountain, score to White Eagle, sees the Rockies again. Then the snowshoes will enable her to carry her papoose in safety. Seven Stars is her name, after the sky which looked down upon their teepee the night she was born. Meanwhile, Brown Bear, squaw to Buffalo Head, prepares for the day when her son will take his place in the ceremonial ritual dances of the tribe. <laughs> Now, Buffalo Head in the ritual chicken dance, which once followed scalping. So, two Red Indian families bring the customs of their tribe to the land of the Great White Queen. Later, White Eagle and his henchmen will smoke a pipe of peace in the field outside. But in the meantime, is it not written that the smoke from a man's own fire blesses the roof of the place wherein he dwells?